Hi, everybody. You're listening to a career advice webinar by the Royal Australian Chemi Chemical Institute, the Professional Association for Chemists in Australia. I'm Dave Samet, coordinator of the RACI Mentoring Program. LinkedIn is a valuable tool for networking with professionals in your field of interest. Recruiters and human resource staff within the science industries use this platform to aid in the recruitment process from advertising to vetting shortlisted candidates. Tonight, our group of panelists will discuss how to optimize our LinkedIn profiles and how to effectively use the platform in order to make important connections and find new opportunities. Before we start this evening's panel session, we'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we are meeting all around Australia. We recognize the elders, past, present and emerging, and also recognize their contributions as Australia's first scientists and engineers, building a healthy and safe community, what they've done and what we can still learn from their ways. We would also like to thank the sponsors for, uh, to Racky's Careers Development Program, EnviroLab, Laboratory Credit Union, and DCS Technical. So I'm joined tonight by three excellent panelists, Andrew Duggins, uh, who's a sales manager at Shimadzu, Matt Chantrell, who is director of GRC Technology at PwC. Uh, G GRC stands for Governance, Risk, and Compliance. And Vincent Koch, who is an industry mentor and advisor. Thank you, gentlemen, all for, for participating in tonight's event. So uh, going around the room, Matt, um, could you give me a two minute introduction about yourself, your position um, and, you know, your role in life? <laughs> yeah, happy to, Dave. Thank you very much for inviting me onto this session today. Uh, so as you quite rightly called out, I'm a director for um, PricewaterhouseCooper, PwC. Uh, my area of focus really is uh, more to do with risk management, but um, I'm bucketed into this area called governance, risk and compliance. Uh, and I work with organizations to help uplift uh, the way that they manage their risk across the organization, or really um, improve the ways that they might manage their compliance activities on a day to day basis as well. So um, it's very apt at the moment because obviously of the big impact that COVID-19 has made across the world, not just Australia, um, but people are revisiting their risk management frameworks, their resilience as an organization, um, and also the uh, added pressure at the moment by organizations just to comply to new government mandates. Uh, my background is that I've been in consulting for about uh, 15 years, uh, predominantly technology consulting um, and more so process consulting as I've evolved my career um, over time. Um, just as a quick introduction to PricewaterhouseCoopers, for those who don't know it, it is a um, accounting firm, uh, but it does do a variety of different other services. So from a consulting perspective as well, uh, it hires people from a range of different backgrounds, from uh, technical out and out computer science through to business degrees. And we also have quite a few grads and vacationers uh, that have come in as well from the medical science as well. And um, also, interestingly, a couple from the chemistry department. Absolutely. I'd actually make a note, Matt, that one of our mentees, uh, one of our former mentees from the program actually works uh, in, uh, started at, at PwC in your graduate program. Mm, great, good to know. Andrew, uh, across to you. Good evening, everyone. Um, fantastic to be back. But you're not bored of me just yet. Uh, my background is chemistry. Uh, I did my PhD pharmaceutical industry, um, I did R&D, I did product development, all that sort of thing. Uh, then I found my way through to Australia and here I went into the cosmetics industry. Uh, my current job is business development. I work with Shimadzu. Uh, my role there is to increase sales, to bring new products to market. And um, beyond and above that, uh, I'm finishing up my MBA degree now with uh, UNSW. So I, I guess the experience I've got is fairly broad. Uh, I didn't really have a goal where I was going to go when I left uni. I, I kind of assumed I'd just become a researcher and uh, I'm at the moment, which is one of choice. 
So I would be thrilled to chat to all of you and to, to hear where you guys are planning on going and, and what your journey looks like so far. Okay, Vincent, over to you. Yes, and uh, thanks, Dave, for the opportunity today to come present to everyone. Um, so my background is actually in software engineering. Um, I'm more on the kind of computer and IT side of things. Um, my experience has been predominantly um, around the media marketing space, um, but more recently kind of going into data engineering uh, as well as data science roles. Um, outside of my day job where I've been working in industries and companies such as Telstra and Qantas, um, I've been doing mentorship and similar kind of um, coaching through such as um, universities like UTS, uh, as well as a number of kind of peak industry bodies as well. So today I'm bringing that experience from a kind of bit of that marketing lens, uh, as well as kind of other people's journeys, um, helping them through that and somewhat even my own journey recently uh, through COVID period as well, navigating the job market through LinkedIn. Um, Vincent, sticking with you, uh, uh, how do you currently use LinkedIn? Yeah, really good question. I think for me, like it kind of goes a few different ways and, and, and I suppose the, the vessels in which I use it change over time um, depending on my needs. So um, job seeking is a very obvious use case there. Uh, for me, it's, it's used as a job seeking tool. But to add to that, it's almost like a live online resume. Um, the way I kind of use it in my case is I've got a lot of recommendations and endorsements written from senior people that I've worked with or clients and vendors, um, which are kind of publicly available. So it's kind of like pre-vetting me essentially. So when people kind of do a Google search of who is said guy, who's Vincent, they can kind of see some stuff and see some information without having to kind of go too far astray. So for me, it's that kind of space there. And secondly, it's a way of kind of informally um, staying in touch with people in, in a very business sense, you know, um, just because I met someone such as yourselves on the panel, I'm not going to suddenly start sharing my uh, Facebook profile with you with my uh, newborn's photos and all the rest of it in the birthday party. So it just kind of creates a bit more of that professional space where we can kind of connect and stay in touch, but not um, not kind of give too much of our personal life away. Yeah. Fair question. Fair question. Um, Matt. How do you engage with with uh, with? Uh, yeah, um, look, very similarly, actually, to what Vincent was saying. Um, so I have used LinkedIn in the past to look for new career opportunities. Um, I have used LinkedIn to find new talent as well for uh, PwC and my previous employers. Um, I predominantly use LinkedIn though more as a marketing and profile and brand awareness activity. So uh, LinkedIn to me, very similar to what Vincent was saying is that it's a living, breathing bio of uh, that profiles your experience to the world uh, that everyone can access. Uh, but it also sort of shares uh, your experiences that are relevant to your area as well. So um, through endorsements, through carefully worded content of LinkedIn, and um, posts that are carefully timed. I think you can actually build your own profile, build your own brand and uh, meet more people through that tool uh, in that way as well. Um, the other way that I use it as well is for professional development as well. So I do use LinkedIn to see uh, what is happening in my broader world. Uh, so if, if I uh, look at my colleagues, I can see you know, new developments that are occurring in the world through them as well. It can be, because I work in quite a specialist area, it can be quite difficult to keep on top of what is going on globally. But through LinkedIn, people are constantly publicizing uh, new developments. So I, I treat it as a news feed as well. Interesting, interesting. The corollary question before I come to you, Andrew, the corollary question to that then is, how often do you check LinkedIn? Uh, I check it multiple times a day. <laughs> really? Yes. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Andrew, over to you. How do you use LinkedIn? Thanks, Dave. Uh, look, LinkedIn for me, it's a matter of finding out who other people are. It's also a matter of promoting who I am. 
Uh, I don't know if I use as much as I should. I, I think it's a very valuable tool, but I think it's only one of a whole range of tools. So it doesn't stand up by itself. You need to incorporate it. For example, you, you, you might network with people prior to actually meeting with them. Um, you might want to look them up, see who they are. Once you've actually met up with somebody, become their friend on LinkedIn, or whatever it might be. Uh, it, it's a tool, it's a repository of information, but it's not the be all and end all to the world. Of course, of course. It does seem to be growing in importance. Now, I will say, Andrew, I have not been an active LinkedIn user. I created my profile, I don't know, eight years back, kind of ignored it. Maybe I created it older than that, um, kind of ignored it. I don't think I've updated my actual career profile since I originally posted it. Um, I don't, I, I, I do post content, but interestingly, most of the content I post is not relevant to the work that I do in the sense that most of the content I post is about mentoring. And that's not how I make my money. That's just something I do because I, I passionately believe in the good that it can be done with mentoring. Um, so it does, I wonder, I start to wonder if maybe I'm failing to use LinkedIn. Interestingly, possibly the biggest thing that I use it for is when I am assisting people with recruitment or when I'm doing recruitment myself, I will look at the person, not at their profile, but at their contacts and see what their contacts say about their behaviours. Do they have a diversity of contacts? Do they have, um, do they have a lot of contacts? You know, how, how does that say about how they interact with the world? That's, that's often what I'm looking for rather than my own stuff. So it could be that I'm completely failing to use it well. So then, Andrew, how often do you use it? Uh, it look, it tends to vary, but I, I'd say I, I probably have a good look at LinkedIn maybe once every two or three days. Wow. Uh, more so if there's actually somebody I'm trying to make a, a connection with or something different is happening in life. Uh, as I think Matt suggested, it's also a bit of a news feed. So you're finding out what people are doing. Uh, and I think you're quite right. It, people can say a lot about themselves but their actions speak a lot louder. So as you suggest, who they're connected with, who they're interacting with, and what they're actually doing seems to, to tell quite a lot about people. Mm, very interesting. Okay. Um, then the fundamental question, I think, for everybody here is, uh, do you believe that a LinkedIn account is essential for, job, for, for the job search and or career advancement in, in the current era? We're still with you, Andrew, so why don't you carry on? Uh, okay, Dave, uh, the, the easy answer is yes, it's absolutely vital. Uh, it is a repository of information. Uh, so again, everybody looks at it, recruiters look at it, uh, colleagues, friends, everybody has a good look. So if, if you don't exist there, then you're two steps behind anybody else. Uh, I do think it's super important that you go to a lot of effort. You, you make your LinkedIn look professional. You, you actually... Uh, in my case, I tried to make it a reflection of my personality, of who I am, of what I enjoy. You, you make uh, mention of your mentoring. Well, that's what you enjoy. So I mean, it's a good reflection of that. So certainly put some time and effort into it. Uh, put the key words in there. I mean, there are lots and lots of helps, uh, checklists online that tell you how to do it. So go through the checklists, um, use all the key words that they're asking. And yeah, I, I think it's got a lot of value there if it looks good and looks professional. Okay. We seem to be going anti-clockwise, so I'll stick with you, Vincent. <laughs> sure. Sorry. Oh, for that same question. The same uh, question. Do you mind repeating the question again? So the Sorry. question is, do you believe that a LinkedIn account is essential for, for the job search and or for the career advancement? Yeah, 100%. I think especially in very kind of highly specialized roles, um, that we're looking at that aren't very advertised very often. What you're starting to see is a lot of recruiters are actually just living on LinkedIn, actually seeking people out uh, in some cases where they need a specific tool set, um, a specific type of experience, a specific sector, wherever it may be, or that combination thereof. Um, if you just happen to have that right kind of experience in there, um, it does definitely click into place. I think a lot of people I speak to, at least in a lot of the kind of more engineering spaced um, roles. And I go, where do you look for roles outside of people they know and kind of industry boards? A lot of people do say LinkedIn. So for me, if that's where you're looking for roles, maybe that's also where you want to be as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Matt, do you have a, a perspective to add to this? Uh, I do, yeah. And um, I'm going to 100% back Andrew and Vincent on this. Um, I think that LinkedIn is critical and crucial for your career as you move forward uh, for a number of different reasons. So um, obviously we're in 2020 now. Uh, the world is digitizing, the world is modernizing, and um, people are moving away from paper-based CVs a lot more. Um, I very rarely get sent CVs these days. Um, I do get sent linked in um, profiles to review. So um, for those who, who don't know much about PricewaterhouseCoopers, uh, PwC is a partnership. So it's run by uh, business leaders that are partners working together for the success of the firm. Um, partners will even hire based off LinkedIn. So they will still interview, but they don't necessarily request CVs these days. So I, I think that's an increasing trend. I think it is your digital profile. I think it's your, uh, it's your CV moving forward. Uh, it's your digital presence as well. So um, I personally don't use many uh, online portals. I have a Facebook account and I have a LinkedIn account. I don't use uh, many of the others that have developed over the years like Instagram. Uh, but employers do search the internet for you. Um, so if I was to interview yourself, Dave, uh, one of the things I would do would be to Google your name just to see uh, what you, you know, what you have done, what your background is. Um, LinkedIn would be one of those top search results that you would get back as well. So I think that LinkedIn profile is your presence online that employers, recruiters, your peers will use to, um, you know, to foster your career. Well, I will say, Matt, I'm both delighted and embarrassed to say that I have Googled myself. <laughs> um, and almost all the front page of results are actually me. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, now, it's interesting. So we've had a couple of questions that relate to what we're talking about here. Uh, do you feel, uh, Matt, that the, uh, that the LinkedIn profile has actually replaced your resume? I mean, virtually you're saying yes. Um, um, and obviously I see you nodding there as well, Vincent. Uh, this is very interesting. Now, I actually had the situation, oh, maybe two years ago, where I advertised a position and, and a candidate texted me, my LinkedIn profile is this. Now, in the ad, it had said, please apply for the position by sending your cover letter and resume. And certainly when you're applying with me, your cover letter is critical. I virtually don't care about your resume. Your cover letter is critical if you're applying with me. And I responded to him to say, well, no, I don't just want to get a text of a LinkedIn. I would like you to actually apply for the job. He says, no, if you want me, you want me, you don't, you don't. Wow. I wonder if I was being a dinosaur when I told him to get stuffed. <laughs> um, what's your perspective? Did I, did I, was I just being old fashioned? Sorry, sticking with you, Matt. Sticking with me. Yeah. Um, look, I, I, I certainly don't feel that you're, um, you're, you know, old fashioned or by yourself in that approach. Um, I'm not saying that there isn't a role for a CV anymore. I think we're starting to move away from it. And um, I think most application processes that you would go through across most industries at some point would still request a CV and cover letter. Um, I, I think there is still that need for it in the process. Not all industries. Um, PwC, I know, for example, would hire um, based on need and the individual skills from LinkedIn. I have seen that happen in the past, um, but I've also seen it work off a CV as well. I think at the moment they're working in parallel. I think um, having a, a good strong CV, having a good strong cover letter and having a good strong uh, LinkedIn profile, I, I think you can't go wrong. Excellent. Thank you very much. Vincent, I see you nodding vigorously. Do you have a perspective you want to add here? Yeah, I think it's interesting because like at the end of the day, whichever organization that you're applying for may have um, a certain way they want to do things, right? So in your case, if it's the cover letter that's important to you, um, as someone who's applying for that job, you should always strive to 
not impress, but tick the boxes, right? Like do do what they ask of you because at the end of the day, you're not going to get through the door and, and, and kind of get, get heard. Um, so you're definitely not in a dinosaur if you want something in a specific way. It's, um, you know, it's, it's your, your wish at the end of the day. Um, but I think one of the interesting questions I was just looking at the Q&A, which somewhat relates to this, is that how do you deal with a case where you've got multiple resumes for each job? Yeah. Um, and how do you kind of play with that with the LinkedIn? So the LinkedIn I see is kind of a little bit of everything and also a few areas that I want to focus on that either highlight my passion or areas that I've really excelled in, whereas the resume itself can be tweaked very specific to that role. So the LinkedIn is almost like kind of a, a teaser and a little bit of everything of what I do, um, but not a lot of that stuff may be in the resume. The resume might be just very to the point. So you know, once it's gone through, say, the, the hiring manager and things like that, and other people want to review it, they might not want to see all that other stuff. They just want to see maybe how do you apply for this um, particular role. So in this case, your tailored resume may, may be the case for that. But again, I'm kind of talking anecdotally. As Matt mentioned, he might have a completely different way he wants to interview people and just purely go off what he sees on the internet. You know, mm. So it's very dependent on the people and you've got to kind of please everyone in a way, if that makes sense. Yeah. Andrew, do you have a perspective to add here? Yeah, look, I, I absolutely do. Uh, I, I am in the sales industry, and I guess one of the things that I've learned there, it's really all about the customer. If you want to sell something, you need to find out what the customer wants. And in this instance, you, you're the person with the money that makes you the customer. If you want somebody to submit something to you in a specific way, it's super important that as the applicant, I do that. Um, and, and that comes to something else. How do I differentiate myself? If I'm the applicant looking for a job. I need to find out what works for you, um, what your history is, what your background is, how you like things, how you like your cup of coffee in the morning. If I can find out that level of information about you, I can actually position myself to be the exact right candidate for, for your job. So yeah, you, you're the person with the control in this instance. Uh, you want something a certain way, you want a cover letter, maybe you want to meet the person, maybe you want to actually chat to the person. If that's what you want. By all means, that's what we need to give to you. Okay. But so I don't derail the topic. So um, you have a profile on LinkedIn. It, it has an equivalency to your CV slash resume. What sort of things should you be doing with your profile then to make that profile stand out? Because you, you were talking about making yourself stand out. So you know what how do, how does the linkedin profile differ from your cv as a means of standing out but the linkedin profile is active it changes all the time you've got no control of when somebody goes to have a look at it so it is important from my point of view that you keep it up to date you, you don't leave it as a, a dead document that you updated six years ago um you, you know the things there are pretty simple have a great photo get somebody to to take a photo of you wearing a suit or whatever's appropriate for the position that you want. Uh, make sure the lighting's good. The, the background that you've got there, it's, it's your catch. It really is, it draws people in. So you've got a beautiful picture of you. Whatever you want in the background should tell a little story about you. I, I'm not quite sure if my LinkedIn profile still has it, but at some stage I was interested in a particular field. And that particular field, I had little diagrams that were moving from left to right, telling a story. Very simple diagrams, little arrows, little squares, crosses, whatever it might have been. And anybody that glanced at that would have gone, ah, this guy's in that field, this is what he's doing. You, you've literally got a few seconds there in which to grab somebody's attention. So use those images to do just that. Interesting. So maybe I should draw a bunch of iron atoms and call it a Ferris wheel, put it in the background. <laughs> That's what works. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. Okay. Well, that is very, very interesting. Matt, did you want to add anything to to the issue of you know your 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 profile itself? Uh, yeah. So I mean, from a profile perspective, I agree with what Andrew was saying. You know, your um, your photo and your introductory paragraph um, should be to the point, professional. Um, you know, convey what you want to convey. Again, it is your brand that you control. So um, if it's a picture of you having a beer with your mates, um, I don't think LinkedIn is the right vehicle for that. 
Um, but it is really just banging the drum about how good you are or could be for a specific job. So um, one of the things that you are limited in on a CV is that you typically wouldn't want to have a 10 page curriculum vitae uh, detailing everything that has ever happened in your life because employers are looking for very specific um, items on a CV as to how good a fit are you going to be professionally and personally for the organization as well. So they are going to look for the key points in that CV and make a decision very quickly as to if you're the right person. Um, LinkedIn gives you a vehicle for promoting more information about yourself. So uh, endorsements is obviously a good item that you can have in LinkedIn. Um, have peers, colleagues, professors, whoever that might be, um, say that you've been a fantastic person to work for. Uh, culturally, you're brilliant to work with. Work-wise, you've got strong ethic. Um, that's, that's obviously very important. And you can also uh, flag individual skills and people can vote on those skills as a community as well. So yeah, it's almost like an independent um, validation of where you think your strengths are and uh, employers can see if others agree as well. So do you then actually go out and request pe um, people among your network to give you endorsements and or to, to uh, upvote your skills, to endorse us those skills? You can do as you're setting it up. Um, you can I, absolutely do that. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I guess I, the I, question I, is, would you? Yeah, um, I would. I, I haven't done it for a while, though. I have done it in the past. Mm -hmm. What about you, Vincent? Yeah, I've used it, um, that functionality quite extensively, I suppose, from the, rec the writing and recommendation part. I've only been wary whilst I'm in a role to do that because it can be seen as if I'm trying to collect references. So it can look kind of suspicious, even though you're doing the right thing. At least from my view, that's how it seems. So I've done it usually whilst I'm um, someone's leaving a role that I worked with, a project or something like that. So it's kind of coming to an end. So let's stay in touch. I'd be great if we can reciprocally give each other recommendations, for instance, So, uh, which can be quite good. In some cases, it's always interesting to get people, um, for instance, like a direct manager could, could be one case, but as Matt mentioned, could be a professor. It could be a vendor's suppliers. Um, it could be other recruiters even. Um, you know, if a recruiter's placed you, you know, how well you were you working with that recruiter, for instance, you know, so... You can kind of think a little bit outside the box because a lot of this is all about people validating different skills that you may have and not all of that has to be technical skills or academic skills. It could be also soft skills as well. Okay. Now, the questions are pouring in, um, but since we're on the topic, uh, someone has asked, is no endorsements better than outdated ones, perhaps from an old field? And, and how might you approach people for endorsements? Vincent, since you yeah. do it, let's, let's stick with you. But what you can do, one of the features in LinkedIn is you can actually hide endorsements or recommendations as they're called. So in my case, there's some that are not as aligned to what I'm doing currently. Therefore, to kind of reduce the noise as you would in a resume and keep it up to date, I've hidden them essentially. So depending where I am in my journey at the time, I can kind of bring them back up or, you know, tweak it that way. So there is that functionality and feasibility there for people to kind of tweak it in that way. Interesting. You know, the more we discuss, the more I'm thinking, I really need to spend some time on my LinkedIn profile. <laughs> um, <laughs> notwithstanding that I'm self-employed. So, it, you know, it's not as if I'm trying to find a job. <laughs> but, uh, you know, give, it a give COVID long enough and maybe we all will be looking for a job. Um, okay, let's take a look. Uh, uh, okay, well, you know, back to the original questions. Uh, what are some things that you can do then to add and strengthen your print profile? Uh, Andrew, do you want to jump in? Uh, yeah, sure. Look, we've been chatting about endorsements. Uh, one of the, the most important thing to people is accepting in something. So if Dave recommends me for something and I, the, the person that Dave recommends um, trusts in Dave, then it becomes so powerful. Whatever I can tell about myself has only got a little bit of power, but whatever the person trusts in you, that power is magnified a hundred times. So I, I couldn't say more. Endorsements or, or advocacy is absolutely important and vital. Uh, so I, I haven't really done that too strongly on LinkedIn, but I think it would 
be very, very wise to do so. Wow, very interesting. Matt, do you want to add? Yeah, um, so, so just to repeat the question, Dave, it was- um, What can what you do to strengthen your profile? Strengthen your profile, yeah. So uh, one of the features I personally haven't used, and I think I've seen this used by others um, quite well, is that you can also showcase your work. Um, so if there's anything that you're particularly proud of, project-wise or paper or research-wise, that, you, uh, that you'd like to promote yourself through, you can actually do that on the, um, on the LinkedIn portal as well. So um, obviously the um, endorsements are, are very critical because it's real world validation of your capability and experiences. Um, but if you also wanna just demonstrate an example that you're specifically proud of, you can also pin that to your profile as well. So, for example, if um, if Dave was looking at um, you know recruiting and specifically for a very targeted area, um, you might be able to find some good examples where someone's done some you know groundbreaking work in that field and um, have an example on their profile as well that will actually you know be the game changer as to if that person gets the job or not. So, yeah. If I could add just a little something to what Matt said there, I, I do agree with you completely. Well, one of those things that you might consider adding is a video of yourself. Mm. Hi, this is my name. I do this. This is what I'm looking for. Uh, that is quite possibly a powerful way of doing things. I completely agree. Look, the thing that I always say to, to early career scientists is the single biggest advantage you have is you right? You know, you don't necessarily have experience. You don't necessarily, you know, have a lot of, a lot of previous work to, 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 to call back on. You don't necessarily have a much of a footprint, but what you have is you and, and expressing you to the world, you know, putting out that great communications, putting out that great energy is absolutely uh, 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 a, a winner, you know? Um, I will actually say just quickly that we did a, um, we did a practice job application as one of the training activities in the, in the Racky mentoring program this year. And the outstanding clear favorite who, who won the event, um, not only did he submit a resume, but he submitted a video application as well. And it just really, it, it, it took him from an excellent, from an excellent application to one that really stood out. Mm. So in fact, I seem to remember Matt that PwC actually uses video interviews as part of your recruitment process. Like that, that, that when a candidate applies, they have to apply with a video as well. Yeah, that's certainly one of the tools that we've used in the past. Um, so we, we have used that where we will set out specific scenarios um, and requests that candidates film their approach to that. Um, so it can be part of the evaluation criteria, uh, not for every job, not for every role, but um, you know, if it's, if it's a very specific example or skill that we're looking for, um, videos are one of the ways that we can request, request that as well. Very, very interesting. Now, um, a related question has come in. If the quick apply function is available on a LinkedIn job advert, should we use it? Is it always better to submit a full resume or cover letter? Well, I would think if, if, the, if the employer has put it there, then they want you to use it, right? Um, yeah, more or less. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so, and Elizabeth has asked the question, and if it's a recruitment company, how do you address the recruiter? Dear sir, madam, is that outdated? No, it's not outdated. <laughs> if you don't know, it's the polite way of, ask, of, of, of addressing it. Um, the, one, the one that really bugs me, though, as, as, a, as an employer, is I put my name in every job ad. You want, to, you want to apply, apply to Dave Summit. The number of people who, who, who apply to dear sir or madam or to whom it may concern infuriates me. You know, my name's right there. Read the damn ad. That goes back to your, your point. Sorry to interject, Dave, about, you know, you're looking for a specific thing and, you know, people need to potentially not, I know it's, a, you know, some people will apply to a lot of jobs when, when you're looking for jobs, but attention is in the detail sometimes with these things. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there's, there's all sorts of questions. Uh, 
and I'm just quickly checking. How do you, how do you recommend that we? Because I'm trying to trying to trying to stick, stick thematically. Do you recommend that we have our CV available on LinkedIn profile? My concern is that the CV structure would change depending on the application for the different type of job or industry. Um, yeah, well, there's there's no perfect, but I, I think that what everybody has said here is that your LinkedIn profile is dynamic, right? Yeah, th that's right. And um, I, th I think if you're looking across multiple industries um, and you're looking to tailor your CV specifically, LinkedIn, I think you would probably need to leave fairly uh, generic because um, to Dave's earlier point, you don't know when people are accessing it. So um, if you're applying like a scattergun, for want of a better word, to multiple different industries or sectors, and then you're looking to tailor your response or your CV specifically to that role, uh, LinkedIn, I think you can convey the message that you're trying to convey using LinkedIn but a specific tailored CV is probably going to be needed on top of that as well. So still use LinkedIn as a tool to sell yourself and what you want to convey. Um, but I, I don't think it should be specifically tailored for one sector if you're looking across multiple. Um, I, I think that will come in time though. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, let's keep going. We've got so many questions, but... Uh, uh, I do want to answer Anna's question, uh, uh, which is, which is Anna asked, um, do you engage with any company pages on LinkedIn? And if so, how? And while you answer that, I'm going to quickly turn on the light because it's getting dark in here. <laughs> Who wants to jump in? Oh, I'll give it a go. Yeah. Um, so for me, the interesting thing here has been, I use it from a, kind of as a newsfeed, as Matt and Andrew had mentioned it as well. So for me, it's like within my industry, which companies are leading that maybe I want to kind of see what they're doing as well from a business sense. So it's a good place to start. Also, if you're job seeking, it's really good to understand what is the language that these companies are using, what's kind of going on internally. So as you start to mimic their behaviors or language and and try and kind of hone in on getting that perfect role, it's, it's a good way to kind of understand and get a much better feel for the industry. Um, other things you can do as well, you can follow people. So even though you're not connecting with them, you can just kind of follow and see what they're doing. They'll get notified of this, but on much larger accounts. So these could be like key industry leaders, um, could be like ex-presidents or whomever. You know, if there's certain skills or attributes that they have or they share content that's very aspirational sometimes, um, you can kind of follow them to kind of keep keep in touch and kind of keep, see what's going on as well. Um and lastly, the other thing I've done is if I've seen new and emerging companies, so in my space of IT and, and, and data and tech, sometimes some companies will come out of the wind and kind of do something quite revolutionary. And sometimes I'll kind of follow them on LinkedIn just to kind of see in a couple of years, like if, if, if they're starting to do something quite differently, because I might have seen them somewhere and had a chat with someone and just, you know, just kind of keep the eye on the ball and on the pulse and, and be in the know. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Andrew, I'd be curious, do you follow a lot of company pages? You know, I probably should, Dave, but I don't. <laughs> uh, look, I, I think what Vincent said there is absolutely right. If you're interested in a particular field or a particular market, then you want to keep your finger on the pulse. You want to know what's happening. Um, personally, I'm a little bit too distracted with a couple of other things, finishing the MBA being one of them. Uh, but if I was looking for a new job or I was super, super attuned to a market or I wanted to be, then I think I would spend a lot more time um, doing just that, following the companies, following the trends and so on. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Um, possibly the question I've been most looking forward to tonight uh, is what are some of the features of LinkedIn that most people might not be aware of? Do you want to jump in, Matt? <laughs> um, so I, I think there's a few um, there that probably should be called out. Um, I won't be able to remember them all. <laughs> so I see LinkedIn as a, as a one-stop shop, really, um, certainly from that recruitment perspective. We've talked a fair bit about 
profiling yourself, building your brand, uh, making sure that the world sees who you are. Um, you can actually use the tool also uh, as a search as well. So looking for jobs, um, I do that through LinkedIn. And I think most of my jobs now I've actually found through LinkedIn. I know that there are other tools, um, obviously like Seek that uh, in Australia that organizations can use for recruitment. Um, yeah, search is a key one. Um, yeah, um, actually I, I can see in some of the questions uh, coming through that what one of the features is coming through LinkedIn now is that there's more, a couple of different features around learning and development. So um, I know that they are expanding that capability to build it out so that you can actually run LinkedIn training courses uh, to expand your soft skills or your hard skills and, um, and grow from that perspective as well. Um, the other one that I just wanted to call out as well was, um, oh, I've just, um, just dropped out of my brain actually there. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll come back to that one actually, Dave. I completely forgot. <laughs> now, I'll quickly add a perspective on, on this learning. because So one, quote, one person has asked, LinkedIn Learning is a service that offers online asynchronous learning for a wide range of subjects. Before, uh, beyond improving your own skill set and knowledge, how valuable can these uh, LinkedIn Learning courses be in improving your skill set, flexibility to recruiters, potential employers, et cetera? Um, I would, uh, as a, you know, somebody who's had a background in recruitment, say it's duly interesting. Number one, because every new skill that you learn is useful. But number two, because it demonstrates behavior. If you, as somebody who has studied, let's face it, we're at the Royal Australian Chemical Institute, so most of us have studied chemistry. If you then show interest in an accounting online learning, in economics, in business management in whatever diverse field that's not just chemistry or not just chemistry adjacent. It shows that you are somebody who has a wider interest and therefore makes you potentially more interesting to an employer. And I see you nodding there, Andrew. I think you would agree with that. But look, I certainly would, Dave. Uh, there's so many educational things online, not just linked to, to LinkedIn. Uh, you could do a Harvard or a Cambridge course online. Some are free even. Um, so th there's just so much out there. And whatever you do, absolutely advertise it. If you've done a three-month or a three-week course, put it on your LinkedIn. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, the value is going to be proportional to the amount of time you spend on it, right? If it's a three-hour course, it's not the same as doing a three-month course. But nonetheless, its mere existence shows willing. Mm. But Matt, you wanted to add... Yeah, actually, I just remembered what the um, other feature was that I'd forgotten that I just wanted to call out as well. Um, I, I see it as a um, positive tool to endorse others as well. So we talked about the skills and endorsements, which you can write references for, uh, for pe people in the tool. Uh, one of the things that you can also do is you can actually um, provide or give awards, which um, means nothing. <laughs> In the big scheme of things, um, you can actually uh, call someone out for being a, a major contributor or um, for being a great communicator or being great to work with. You can actually um, call someone out. It's like a prestige thing as well. So it's, it's more along the social side of it than a professional side of it. But um, I know that you can actually just really sort of recognize people through the tool as well. Um, and I, I just think it's a really nice touch. Um, I've called people out that I've worked with in the past uh, for being like a star player. Um, and it just gives people a bit of extra kudos as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Vincent, other things that we don't know about or people don't know about? Before I get to that, I might just round off the LinkedIn learning question. One other thing, like this has come up in mentoring to me many times. It's like, should I do X, Y, and Z course? Well, you know, besides what the course is called or whatever, like what value are you going to get out of it doing that training, right? Like if you're going to learn some new skill or it's going to add to you as a person, definitely do it. And then if you believe then that's the case, then definitely add it to your profile because then that conversation may come up in an interview process, go, oh, you've done accounting, why is it? Then you can start to show more dimension and breadth to, to, to the work that you do and how you may have applied that and in, in, in kind of previous work that you've done as well. So 
that's definitely something to be cognizant of as well. Um, one of the main ones, and obviously some people will be kind of uh, based on the questions around job seeking. Um, I know there's that kind of aspect around premium, not premium. So one of the reasons why I've used premium in the past um, has been around the job seeking aspect of it. So um, you can kind of enable it for a short period of time, pay it on a monthly basis. And some of the features that you can unlock, say, as job seekers, is it actually knows based on your profile, once you've added all that rich information, jobs that are relevant to you or highly relevant to you based on your experience and other things and where the machine may think that you rank. So what actually happens behind the scenes, um, if I'm an employer, um, it actually sorts um, job applicants by what it thinks might be more relevant to me, to the top. Um, and essentially this part of the algorithm is then shown back to you if you're premium. So I might be applying for a job and it goes actually you're in the top 10% or the top 50% of applicants potentially. I mean, it's not a, you know, be or end or it's just basing on number of years you've worked in particular roles or the job titles and the skills and endorsements and things that you have. So it's not an exact science, but definitely helps you to kind of see things that are going on. And in some cases, the other thing it can let you do as well is see who the hiring manager or the person who's listed that job is. So although you may not be able to contact them, you can kind of see who they are. Is there anyone in common that you have with them that can kind of put in a good word? Maybe something like that. So you know, opens up those kind of avenues from a job seeking perspective as well. And lastly, when you go onto the company as well, we'll show, you know, how many people they've hired over the last couple of years, what's the average tenure. So, you know, really helps you build a case and a perspective around the company as well from a research perspective um, when it comes to job seeking. Well, sticking with that question then, because certainly this was going to be an important question is, is LinkedIn premium worth it? Because one of the aspects is, you know, it goes from zero to 100 pretty quickly, or literally zero to 50 pretty quickly, right? There's, there's no intermediate space. There's no dipping your toe in the water. It's pretty pricey to jump in, right? So what else does LinkedIn Premium offer beyond, you know, for instance, what would LinkedIn profit offer to me when I'm not a job seeker? Yeah, so the other aspect of it is to be able to contact people. So on the free version, there's limits to how many people you can contact out of the blue that you've got no connection with essentially, right? So this gets around it because some people use it for business and for networking. So, you know, you want to, you get, you basically pay to play essentially. So otherwise it will kind of restrict you in terms of um, reaching out to people, say that that's not within your networking uh, circle. So if you wanted to develop yourself, personal development or go out for new business and things like that, you obviously have to pay for that privilege and that's definitely one case of it. Um, on the flip side, you know, recruiters or businesses that want to find out more about other things that are going on or potentially looking to hire people, again, pay for the premium access so they can kind of see a lot more profiles and be potentially contact more people as well. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. Obviously, the learning and other things kind of wrap around that as well. Hmm. So uh, ultimately, to ask the question that Matt has asked here, um, Matthew Winnett, by the way, uh, I'd like to recommend fine young man has been very active with the mentoring program and uh, 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 he's definitely on my radar. Um, he's asked, is it worth it? Yeah. So in my case, I say yes, but I've only used it in a job seeking sense, right? So yeah. for a short period of time for a given purpose, you know, um, unless you're out there and it's like a business tool for you, say, you know, it's, it's getting a lot of business or it's getting a lot of research projects, wherever it may be, then, you know, it's just finding that angle. But I usually find it's just a point in time thing for, for a given purpose. Um, I'd be quite keen to see what Matt and Andrew think about that as well. Yeah, well, let's go over. Matt, what do you think? Yeah, uh, I think that it's really good points that Vincent made. Um, I should actually say that I've not really used premium. I, I have tried the free trial for about 30 days. Um, and I, I did think it was, uh, it does augment the tool. So it does make you a bit of a power user. You certainly get a lot more visibility, um, like Vincent was saying. Um, you can contact people without any restrictions. And that's probably the only issue with free LinkedIn is that there are some blocks that you do hit occasionally. Uh, you can't necessarily see everyone that's seen, seen your profile. Uh, you may see one or two faces, but the rest of them will be blocked from you. So, so there are restrictions in there if you go for the free version. But um, I, I've never found the need to go premium, actually. So um, I, I would say it's probably not worth it, but only because of the way that I use the tool. I think if you're a recruiter or in sales, 
I think you'd probably get more value than I would. It might be a good segue. To- <laughs> I was going to say, could there be a better segue? <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, you're still muted. Yes, indeed. Look, I also don't have any experience with the premium version. Uh, I suppose what I would do if the next time I am looking for a job, I would definitely give it a try. I know you can get a week or a month trial, whatever it might be. Uh, I hadn't really thought about it from a sales perspective, uh, but you're right. Maybe it does give you a little bit more insight. Uh, data analytics, big data, it's, it's definitely the way forward. Yeah, well, certainly my marketing manager advised me last week that she would like to set up a, a LinkedIn premium for me and and she she wants to to, to, to better utilize my LinkedIn. Um, I, I am actually curious. I receive an email from LinkedIn about once a week that says, you know, 150 people have looked at your profile and to find out who they are, you need to subscribe to LinkedIn premium. I don't know whether that's meaningful or not. Vincent, do you have a perspective? Since you're the one who's, who's used LinkedIn pre- pre- Premium, do you have a perspective on that? Yeah, it depends, again, what, what's the use case when we're choosing it for? Like, if it's for business cases, then, you know, maybe you are interested in seeing who's kind of looking to you and you can kind of give them a call. In my case, when I'm job seeking, you know, if I'm look, seeing certain recruiters or HR managers at some certain companies having a look at my profile, then I can kind of make inroads through there and, and see, you know, is there a job opening up potentially, things like that. Um, but again, it's just the, what's the, what's the use case. And like on the sales one that you mentioned there, like you can actually specifically target like particular roles in particular companies and sizes and things like that. And that's why it makes it quite beneficial to find people of a, of a certain skill set that you might be seeking out. So um, they'll be doing that. And on your site, you know, you'll be, your profile will be viewed and you won't know who it is. So does it, does it matter to you? And if it does, then yeah, maybe have a look other than that. You know, it's just another person visiting your profile. Mm. It's funny, actually, the thing that's never occurred to me until tonight is that uh, I could potentially use it to better the mentoring program by searching for people with skills that are relevant to the mentoring program. Yeah. Like, so for instance, if you wanted to find panelists, yeah, potentially. <laughs> well, that's just darn interesting, <laughs> now, isn't it? <laughs> it is, yeah. Um, um, okay, now the classic question: um, accepting invitations from other people, right? Um, you know, how do you distinguish a request from someone you don't know from between a genuine request and something that's just spam or junk mail? Yeah, before you accept it, like one thing I'll add is on your profile, if you've got your phone number, email address, things like that, as soon as you click accept, your connection can see those unless you've hidden your privacy settings and things. So I ask everyone to just kind of have a review of your profile before you start doing this because then what you start getting is elicited phone calls and SMSs and spam and, and all the rest of it. So that's something to just be mindful of. Um, some people do it to just grow their network. As I mentioned with LinkedIn, you know, you've got a certain number of connections and things that you can do within your given network. Once you go out of that network, you have to pay. So some people essentially will try and connect with other people that have larger networks. And that's where that whole first degree, second degree, third degree connection thing comes into LinkedIn. So people use it as just a way to kind of bridge their network. So as they search for people, they can kind of get in touch with people more. Um, but it doesn't hurt to just put a message, you know, hey, you know, I'm just trying to network more or wherever it may be um, before they, you know, before they connect with you. So it's, it's down to you. If you feel like there's value in, in networking with that person, yeah, by all means, go and accept. Certainly, I strongly recommend, and I think you would all agree, when yeah. you do send an invitation to somebody else to seek to connect with them, don't just leave I'd like to connect the standard message, explain who you are and why you want to connect. And you'll be much more likely to get that connection. But Matt, how do you decide? Somebody you don't know sends you an invitation to connect. How do you decide? Oh, hang on, Matt. What's happened to your sound? Sorry, that's my fault. I was on mute on my laptop. Uh, I will always, without fail, uh, when I review my um, invites, 
I will always look at the message as you're saying there, Dave. Um, and I'll always click on the profile of the person requesting contact and I'll review the profile to see if there is any value in connecting to them via LinkedIn. So is the way that I'll define value there is, um, do they work in the same space? Do they know the same people? Um, you know, is there value in connecting with them potentially even, um, face to face um, or are they just going to be accessing my account for their own gain and no gain for myself so I always have a look through their profile and if I can't see any reason to connect I will just decline um, if there is a good connection value proposition uh, then I will accept so and that will be based on the message and also their um, their profile as well so if they're completely you know different space to me um then i'd probably decline it unless there was a good justification in the um in the message okay andrew look i, I think matt's got it uh whenever i get a linkedin uh, request i i have this conflicting thing that goes on in my head i i don't like to say no because i kind of feel it's a little bit rude but then at the same time if if i've just got a flick to request uh, connect I'll go, yeah, where's the value? If I don't get an actual two sentences, hi, my name is, and I work with such and such a person, I'm interested in what you're doing. If I don't get that, I discount it. And exactly as Matt said, if, if you're not in the same industry, there's no connectivity whatsoever, then I'm going, why are you trying to connect to me? So the chances are you're probably going to get a rejection. Yeah, yeah. Now, you, I mean, it's, I think it's fairly clear to all of us and we all suffer from that, that moment of dissonance, don't we, Andrew? Because I don't want to ever be rude. I don't want to be unfriendly. I want to, yeah. I want to welcome people into my life. But at the same time, I don't want to wel welcome spam into my life. Yeah. Now, I had the recent, this actually happened two weeks ago. A gentleman contacted me. Now, a lot of the invitations I get are because I'm active in careers and mentoring. And so, therefore, people aren't necessarily going to have a direct link to my world because their interest is not what I do for a living. It's what I do for a passion. Um, but this guy contacted me and he said, I'd like to connect. I responded as I always do. If they, if I don't have enough information, I respond and say, look, I don't believe we've worked together before. Um, but if we have, you know, remind me. I'm, I, uh, and if we haven't, what you know i'm open to new connections why are you connecting with me at the moment and he wrote back and he said oh, I'm, I'm very interested in what you do and i took it to be the mentoring stuff so i accepted his connection he straight away within 15 minutes i got a spam email saying i do management consulting and here are, here are the services that i offer and i felt very betrayed i felt that it, i had been misrepresented was i wrong to feel that way gentlemen I felt that he'd snuck under my guard by misrepresenting. I think you certainly did. Did you disconnect with him? I did. And he, um, he got quite stroppy with me. But the people that are most irritating are the ones that are trying to sell you something. He was clearly trying to sell you something. Uh, often you'll get a request that is, you can see it's a copy and paste. If it's a copy and paste, get rid of it. So there's the lesson to everyone listening you know do it right tell them why you want to connect people are open to connecting with you if they know why and if they know that they, you're not just after something okay um uh well then the classic question the classic corollary to that is um should you attempt to make connections with people that you have never met the you know the, obviously how do you approach this but you know is it okay to met, match with people that you've never met before who's that for <laughs> well anybody but i see you leaning in matt so go for it <laughs> um actually i um i don't want to be too much of a hypocrite because i do send out connection requests to people that i've never met in person um so if i find people that i feel would be valuable to know um, or I would like to learn from. Um, I, I have reached out to people before. Um, everyone treats LinkedIn differently as well. So some people just randomly accept any request as they come through um, just to build their profile 
or their um, connection base. Um, but I, I have sent out connections to people. Um, if they've truly never met me or wouldn't know me, I, I just add a comment as to what is the purpose of my connection request. So, you know, I just sort of say I'm, uh, I either work in that space we've never met, but I'd be keen to, you know, connect with you face to face if we can or have a phone call or um, I'd be keen to hear your thoughts about a specific topic. So um, just to let them know that there is an actual real justification for my connection request and I'm not just a um, an online troll just uh, looking for, for new contacts. So um, I, I do reach out to people quite regularly. Agreed. Um, Vincent, I imagine that you do as well. Yeah, totally. Just echoing what Matt said is completely the same. Another approach I've taken as well is to go for people a bit left field or somewhere you know, things that I'm interested in um, that might not be area of expertise for me. So same as you would in the real world, networking with people, you know, how do you build a base of people that do other things other than what you do? Because then what ends up happening is you might need them for something or they may need someone with your skills or, or knowledge. Um, and that's where a lot of the value comes into play here. Absolutely. Of course, the corollary to all of this is when COVID lifts and we are actually back able to get out into the world and meet people face to face, then one of the things that you do at the end of a, an event is you take those cards and you do link with those people that you did meet, you know, because you have met them. Not, you know, you're not going to come back with 50 cards and, and, and have 50 new connections, but, but after an event, you might have five. Well, yeah, a feature that they have on the LinkedIn mobile one, actually, if you've got the app installed, this is something I used for a while when I was in like a lot of meetings with a lot of people I haven't met before when I was kind of more sales focused and one of my jobs, um, it would actually send me like a little reminder going, Oh, would you like to connect with them or just give me like a little bit of a profile around them as well. I think it was LinkedIn um, that was doing this feature directly in their app. So, yes. you know, it just kind of good way to kind of segue. Also you can follow up as well, you know, um, to go, oh, you know, it was great meeting you. Would love to grab a coffee sometime or schedule a, a meeting, um, you know, for whatever area it is. It doesn't always have to be about, you know, job seeking or, or business as well. It could be about, you know, just pure networking as well. Absolutely. Andrew, you had a perspective to add? Oh, absolutely. There, there certainly is a function within the LinkedIn app, uh, proximity function. So if, if you're close by, you just send a quick request and you, you're instantly connected. Um, I, I think, uh, as Vincent said earlier, the big thing is when you do connect with people, give them a reason to connect with you. If you're going to send them a request, say something, Dave, I really enjoyed your career development presentation tonight. You said some really great things. I think there's a lot I can learn from you. you uh, you've complimented Dave and you've said, hey, he, he can teach you something. He's going to, yeah, sure, of course, I'll, I'll connect with you. So offer, offer the people something, um, a perspective, something funny, something interesting, a bit of respect, whatever it might be. Give them a reason to, to connect with you. Absolutely. And if history uh, repeats itself, then each of you will receive a few LinkedIn uh, requests uh, tonight. Uh, <laughs> that usually happens after a webinar. <laughs> so, uh, um, I, Gentlemen, this has been such an interesting conversation that I have actually lost track of time. And I, I realise we're actually over time. So I'll try to wrap up. But there is one really important point that we haven't covered tonight. And that is the content that, that we post ourselves. So... In simple, what's the best way to engage a network? You know, what, what do you post? How do you stand out in your posts? And how often do you post? Well, wow, that's a big compound question, isn't it? Matt, I'm going to start with you. Um, I, will, I will start with the how often do I post? Um, I don't post that frequently, to be honest, because one of the reasons I do post is to make an impact. Um, so I, I think if I post too much via LinkedIn, um, people do get a little bit bored of the message that's coming out. So if I have a major event or a major message that I want to deliver, I will do that through LinkedIn. Um, and then I will track the sort of responses through LinkedIn as well. So um, monthly, quarterly, more or less? So, yeah, probably monthly is probably about fair. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And how do you make your posts stand out? Um, so I, I would... Um, very commonly post through a like a PWC message or events that might be coming out. 
Um, so I would use a combination of um, a high impact graphic on the LinkedIn. So people would notice it as they're looking at the screen or scrolling down the screen. Um, I'd also attach a bit of a blurb um, above the post as well, just to sort of say, you know, really exciting opportunity that is coming up. And I'll, um, I'll also, you know, be cool with the kids and throw in a few hashtags. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, Andrew, what about yourself? Posting? Look, I, I do that very rarely, I must say, uh, but I'm conscious that when I do post, as Dave said, it's got to have a high impact graphic and it's got to be useful. It, it can't, you don't want to spam people, you want to actually give something to them. So if, if I've got a fantastic, beautiful, amazing event going on, sure, I'll use that as a reason to post. Uh, it's I try not to waste people's time. So I might do one paragraph of text, you know, maybe four lines or five lines. There's no chance on earth I would do 20 lines because nobody's going to read that. So it's short, succinct and useful. Now, Vincent, I would imagine that you are probably a more prolific poster. I was. I haven't been in a while, but very bad lately. Um, however, one of the things I do find with the posting aspect of it, this is an area where the whole kind of personal branding really kind of plays a good role. You know, if there's a way that maybe it's the, the way you use your imagery or the way that your text is, you know, written each time that when people see it, they go, oh, that's, you know, that's Dave or that's Matt or, you know, whoever it is posting, it kind of creates that image. Um, and I think that that's definitely something that you can play to as well. Um, a lot of people that then end up doing this and then, you know, the good thing is to maybe drive comments, um, or drive engagement as well. So one of the features that a lot of people are playing with right now on LinkedIn is this polls. So you can go, Oh, you know, just quick five seconds. What do you guys think? A, B, C, or D. Um, and this has been kind of quite an interesting feature that people are using to drive engagement because once people comment or engage with your, your post their network starts to see that content. So I might see something that someone else is uh, engaged with. And then that's how you kind of broaden your reach as well. Absolutely. And then the classic question has come from the floor, which exactly relates to this, is how does an early chemist do the same of offering value? I guess the, so the only perspective I can offer is if you don't have something of your own to say, because you're still fairly early in your career, there's always sharing or reposting something interesting that somebody else has said. Yeah, 100% agree with that. And I think where you can add value to that, Dave, would be your opinion, right? And that's where you start to develop your view or your idea or your approach to a problem. You know, you don't have to agree with everything, but your audience might be intrigued to, to hear your perspective on something as well. And again, once you add in that flavor of connecting with people that might not be specifically from your industry or specialism, that's when they'll be like, oh, you know, such and such said this and they had a perspective perspective on this that was quite intriguing and that's potentially uh, an approach that you could take okay I, I that's that's very interesting Vincent because I would possibly from my perspective add a corollary or add, add a, a cautionary add, add to, to that and that is agree or disagree fine but always do so from a positive perspective you do not want to be an online troll right um, I have a whole blog post about what I call anti-social media um, so, uh, so yeah, be damn careful as, as an early career chemist, you want to be seen as nothing but positive. Yeah, agree. And I, and I usually stay away from anything politics or religion or anything that's going to be kind of, what's the word in the public eye, um, just because people might have a, an alternative view. Um, and then you're just alienating potential clients, potential, um, yeah. job opportunities and things like that yeah. as well. Yeah. And just remember, what you think is funny, the internet does not. <laughs> the, the, the comment that you make that you think is a, is a funny little dig at something won't necessarily... Lots of trolls have no sense of humour. Um, Matt, do you have a perspective to add there for young, for young chemists? Um, yeah, I, I just completely agree with what you said, Dave. Um, I think it is a way of uh, promoting yourself um, but also it can be a way of promoting your point of view and beliefs as well. So um, resharing other work that you feel is valuable um, is not a bad thing. So um, I agree with what you're saying. Mm -hmm. 
Andrew, you get the last word. Goodness, Dave, I wish it was something useful. <laughs> uh, that these gentlemen have said the right things. Uh, I, I agree. Um, yep, I don't really have anything else to add to that. Okay. Well, I've got to say, this has been the most fascinating discussion, possibly the, the, uh, the, the, the event that I've enjoyed most all year. Um, I have learned a great deal and I've learned a great deal about what I'm doing wrong or at least failing to do. So, uh, so my marketing manager and I are going to have a very interesting discussion tomorrow. Um, look, there's just one new question coming in. Let's finish on this question. Um, will you be comfortable in receiving LinkedIn requests as in connection requests or do you, are you more comfortable if someone just follows you? Um, I personally prefer connection requests. Um, I'm always happy to meet new people um, as long as, um, you know, if, if there's value in it, um, you know, connecting, I don't mind connecting with people in different industries, but um, yeah, just drop me a note and um, yeah, happy to connect. Yeah. I don't even mind a passive connection. Just don't abuse the privilege. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Likewise, same here, David and Matt. Absolutely. Happy to connect. Just make your introduction something interesting and funny and by all means. Yeah. Now, I will say the little funny thing that I read yesterday is it's possible that the universe is full of vampires and that we just don't know it because all of the telescopes have mirrors. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, okay. Uh, Look, I think we'll wrap it up there. We've, we've, we've taken enough of your time, everybody. Thank you so much. So here's the blurb at the end. Tonight has been another event as part of the Racky Careers Development Program. Through webinars, networking events, mentoring, lectures and workshops, the Racky Careers Development Program aims to help uh, graduating students and early career chemists get the best possible start in their careers. Our upcoming events include the online networking, Camaraderie, which is uh, Thursday, the 5th of November. And next week, next Thursday, we have the most wonderful event, Careers Hack, where active job seekers can talk to a panel of experts, recruitment consultants and HR people, and we will help you develop an individual job search strategy tailored to your needs. Uh, the recording of this event will be uploaded to Racky, Racky Careers Development YouTube channel over the next few days, as well as to my own careers website on dcstechnical.com.au forward slash careers. In the meantime, thanks to all of our presenters tonight, Andrew Duggan, Matt Chantrell and Vincent Koch, and to our, to our sponsors, EnviroLab, Laboratory Credit Union and DCS Technical. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your, your participation tonight. It's been awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much and good night to everyone. Very good night to you. Thank you, everyone. There we go.